I got to tell you something. Uh, this book is uh, more than capable of speaking on its own, and I think the only reason Liz and I are here uh, is because we are having studs withdrawal. For the last eight years, Liz and I shared that stage at the Herald Washington Library with studs, talking about his life, his times. Liz has known him for a long time. I have known him since the day he came to Wesley Hospital, the night I was born, to take my dad out for a drink. That's a very long time, and it's hard to shake studs, uh, who died on Halloween this year. But this book brings him back to life for me uh, in an unexpected and unbelievably charming and real way. Uh, I know you agree, Liz. Uh, Paul and Harvey, whose idea, how'd you do this? Who's the genius who came up with this? It's unbelievably good. Paul, and it's, did he? Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, it was, Paul deserves, I think, you know, Paul deserves, uh, a, you know, like, I think a lion's share of the material, I mean, the, the, the praise for, uh, for doing the book. Um, for one thing, he's, he's taught oral history uh, for a long time at Brown University, and, you know, he's for a long time been a, a, a Studs Terkel admirer and, and fan. I, I think that, you know, that the, I think the artwork was real nice, too, and, uh, you know, it was just... <laughs> It's and not you know, all yours either. It's not all <laughs> yours, is no, it's it? Not. No. I mean, you know, I, I, I didn't mess around with his words. I just, I didn't change anything. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I just broke the uh, text down into uh, panels for, you know, for some of the artists that uh, apparently didn't want to or I don't know what. But <laughs> anyway, that's. Yeah. But Paul, Paul, I've been working with Paul on a few projects now. Yeah, he suggests some, men, and then... Um, when he suggested this, did you all of a sudden go, were you excited immediately about it? I'm always excited when I get a chance to make more money. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing thrills me more. Uh, yeah, no, but I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I was aware of Studs Terkel, and, and I, I, I have, a, you know, a connection with him. We both are real interested in quotidian life and stuff. He, I guess he interviewed... Mostly because you let it, you know. Well, he interviewed people about their jobs, and I just, you know, used to just write. And I, I wrote about my job, you know, it's like an autobiographical thing. But, you know, I mean, I immediately saw, you know, like felt an affinity for him when I became aware of him, I guess, in the 70s. Did you ever meet him? No, I never have. That's a shame. You, I mean, I can speak first. You guys would have loved each other. I'm serious. Don't you think, those of you? So, Paul, the seed of this is, uh, had you talked about this with studs? Uh, you know, uh, just a little, a very small amount, and mainly through friends in, in the studs last year or two. So uh, I had done a, a book or two with the, the New Press, a really wonderful publisher, and uh, they are responsible for bringing out Studs' work in so many volumes. Uh, and it seemed like a natural step for me to propose a, a Studs Comics volume uh, because uh, 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 the new press uh, embodies his work, but also because, as Harvey suggested, from my point of view, I taught oral history for a, a decade at Brown, and when you teach oral history to college students, or for that matter, high school students, or Studs is the one and only charismatic personality in the field of oral history. There's some people who write extremely intelligently about the philosophy of it and, and the problems with it and so on and so forth, and there are thousands of us, me included, who've done a whole lot of field work of our own in oral history. But when you think of uh, uh, books to assign that give students at any level uh, an idea of what oral history can do, you invariably come back to studs as the first person. And that's true for oral historians, uh, uh, people who teach oral history in, in Europe and presumably Asia, everywhere in the world, as well as the United States. There's no figure like Studs Terkel within uh, oral history, a small field, a field that has very little respect within academic life, uh, but which represents a, a popular approach to history that uh, is par excellence, that it exceeds any 
other historians' uh, uh, grip of the quotidian life. Well, as, I think as, 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 as yeah. Liz well knows that, that uh, and talk about this, Liz, that, that one of the great things about Studs, Studs was a trained actor before he started doing oral histories, and he, was, he, he fell into different radio shows and was really good at that. And he was the most mechanically inept human being yeah. in the world. I mean, like, most oral historians would go in and say, please, let's talk and just sit there. Studs would. Well, he would always say that you know, one of his, his great advantages was that he was inept with the tape recorder, right? And, yeah. And then one of his amazing stories, it's one of just, it just I love this story, it tells of, of a woman in public housing. Is this one you were talking about, Rick? It, ah, it's amazing, the story in public housing, and he's interviewed her, and uh, her small child is, after the interview is, is uh, or before the interview, uh, is futzing with the tape recorder, and, um, and then they have the interview, and then the boy goes back to the tape recorder, and as Studs tells it uh, much better than I, uh, watches the, the kid and then suddenly the tape plays and it's the woman's voice mm -hmm. and she says I never knew I felt that way mm -hmm. and I feel like that's what what studs is about he just that was the genius that was the genius of it wouldn't you think Paul that he was able to and in, in reading it in this fashion, which I think, and tell me I'm wrong about this, you know, I don't know much about the, you know, I'm old fashioned that way, but I know graphic novels and graphic representations of words are becoming increasingly, increasingly popular, that this is a way, I think, to introduce studs to that generation that might ordinarily or might miss him. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, it's also true of the uh, book we'll be talking about tomorrow, The Beats, because uh, yeah. it's a way of getting readers, mainly under 25, to uh, look at books, I think about reading those books, when they simply wouldn't come into contact with them otherwise. Um, a question, you know, Studs has written so many wonderful books, you know, uh, the, the Good War, which he always said, Ida said it should be in parenthesis, mm -hmm. Good War, uh, Hard Times, Division mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. So how did you decide? Well, that's that a great question. I'm anticipating that question because I went round and round with the new press uh, editors about it. And, and I had different suggestions at different times. Uh, Hard Times has always been a fabulously important book to me, and I don't want to put aside his stuff with jazz musicians and everything else that we could, most of this audience could come up with. And uh, the answer probably is pretty simple, the, that Working is the book that is perhaps even better known than Studs himself at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, it just happened that the state endowments for the humanities produced little playlets based on working 20 years ago, and it just happened that I was the humanist in the little state of Rhode Island who would then engage the audience in a conversation about it. It was all sort of <laughs> like a, a, an occurrence. Uh, and uh, what working managed to do, in my experience with audiences and with students, was to epitomize what's best in oral history, which is to say to legitimate the uh, daily lives of ordinary people who would not consider themselves worthy or at least likely ever to be interviewed and ever talk about their own lives in that fashion, which is exactly what uh, the, the point Liz brought up. I mean, it's not an unusual thing in any field of oral history with ordinary blue collar or a little middle class people to say after the interview, I never knew I felt yeah. that way, or indeed to begin crying. That's a perfectly ordinary experience of, of, of somebody interviewing uh, as somebody in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. It just things come up that they didn't anticipate speaking about. And as I always say to students, you don't want to stop them from crying or, or anything because th this is an experience that's terribly important to them. It validates their life in some, in some fashion or another. Uh, uh, but uh, even though that is the oral history experience, uh, in a way, uh, nobody so well articulated it and demonstrated it over the last 30 years as, as Studs did. And one could say he created the field of oral history. So you decide to do this book. Do you immediately think of Harvey? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, a little bit because I had already uh, begun working with Harvey. We did a book on the Students for a Democratic Society together. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, because uh, suddenly it hit me, uh, maybe in the middle of the night, as these things do, uh, the awakening moment at 2 a.m., 
that uh, Harvey, in many ways, uh, was a, a, a studs turkle of a, of a different generation, 